David. Um, welcome, everyone, to the Coastal Observing in Your Community webinar series being hosted by Socora, Southeast Coastal Ocean Observing Regional Association. Socora is one of the 11 regions that is part of the U.S. NOAA-led Integrated Ocean Observing System, also known as IUS. The title of this webinar today is Coastal Ocean Circulation Influence on Matters of Societal Concern. Shakora is hosting the webinar series as a part of our 10-year anniversary. The point is to discuss and highlight coastal ocean observing in the Southeast U.S. Monthly, usually every fourth Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern in 2017, invited speakers will discuss ocean observing topics. Each topic will be um, about a 60-minute webinar and recorded in archive for future viewing on our website. My name is Abby Wakely, Socora's Communications Specialist, and I will be facilitating and moderating the webinar. All participants will be in listen-only mode. You can type questions for the presenter or technical questions in the bottom left-hand chat box. I will be monitoring the questions during the presentation, either responding to them directly or posting the questions to our presenter. We are record Once again, we are recording the webinar and we'll be posting the recording on the Socora website. We are very, very excited to welcome um, Dr. Robert Weisberg as our first speaker of the webinar series. Dr. Weisberg is a distinguished university professor of physical oceanography at the University of South Florida. His current research emphasizes the West Florida continental shelf and the interactions occurring between the shelf and the deep ocean and between shelf and the estuaries. He maintains a coordinated program of in situ observations, analysis, and numerical circulation models aimed at describing and understanding the processes that determine West Florida shelf water properties with applications to matters of societal concern. Um, so Dr. Weisberg, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and turn the controls over to you. Okay. Well, thank you. Now let's see if the controls work. <laughs> they do. Wonderful. Okay, well, um, so I want to thank all of you for being with us today, and I hope I'll get an opportunity to explain to you what I think coastal ocean observing is all about and provide a few examples of what we've been doing here and, and how it does have impact to matters of societal concern. So let me begin with um, an overview. Although, Abby, I think, uh, you know, I was able to move one slide, and now I seem to have, oh, there it goes. I just need to be patient. Okay. So the coastal ocean is quite literally where society meets the sea. It's where we recreate, where we fish. It's where maritime commerce hubs are established, uh, where we worry about things like harmful algal blooms, where fossil fuels are tapped and alter alternative energy sources are considered for exploitation. So managing these competitive uses requires that we understand how the coastal ocean system works. So coastal ocean observing system science is all about how the coastal ocean system works. And so that picture on the left is a book that I purchased for my grandchildren. The title is The Way Things Work. Uh, we cannot responsibly manage the coastal ocean if we do not know how it works. And workings are all about connections. Connections begin with the circulation because this is what determines water properties and hence the environment in which organisms make their livings. So habitat is not just the rocks on the bottom, it's what surrounds those rocks and what allows organisms that live in the vicinity of those rocks to actually eat. So I'm going to use three vignettes to illustrate the importance of the coastal ocean circulation. The first one will be about GAG grouper recruitment. The second one, how deepwater horizon oil arrived on northern Gulf beaches. And the third one will entail uh, red tide. So first, what is a regional coastal ocean observing system, or an ARCUS? It is a coordinated set of observations and models. The sampling problem is too large for observations alone, 
Hence, models are needed to fill the gaps. But models without observations are fraught with errors. It's very clear that we need both of these. You can't have one or just the other. So let's look at what we're doing for observations on the West Florida Continental Shelf, which is a regional coastal ocean observing system as part of SOCORA, which is the broader southeast and uh, the southeast United States and eastern Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, many of you might think that the Gulf of Mexico is all GQs. Well, it's not. We actually initiate Socorro as including the entire state of Florida because the water properties on the east coast of the United States are derived in part by the Gulf Stream. And the Gulf Stream has its origin in the Gulf of Mexico. And so when you, for example, have a red tide off of the Carolinas, guess where it came from? It came from my backyard. And so if we don't understand those connections, if we don't study the system as it, nature actually presents it, then we're kind of cut short. So we use different techniques for observing the ocean. One of them is moored buoys. You see an example on the lower right and on those buoys, we hang instruments that not only measure surface meteorology, but also water properties from the surface down to the bottom, including the currents. Um, to the left of that, you see a rendition of surface geostrophic currents estimated from satellite altimetry. The colors are the sea surface height, red being high, blue being low. For example, the gradient across the Gulf Stream where it goes from red to blue, that amounts to a meter of sea surface height. So the east coast of the United States has water standing about a meter lower than the water on the other side of the Gulf Stream. And from that height difference, we can estimate what the ocean currents are. So you can very clearly see the loop current entering the Gulf of Mexico through the Yucatan Strait, looping around, that's why it's called the loop current, exiting as the Florida current through the Straits of Florida and then heading up the East Coast uh, as, as the Gulf Stream. But it's one connected current. They're not separate. And the, this loop current, Florida current, Gulf Stream system can carry materials from the West Coast of Florida right up to uh, the entire Southeast of the United States. To the left is uh, a footprint of high-frequency radars. High-frequency radars are land-based instruments that project a radar signal out across the ocean, which reflects off of uh, waves. And from the Doppler shift of the outgoing and incoming radar signals, we can estimate what the surface currents are. And so we have a couple of ways of getting at the surface, the satellite altimetry and the radars, but we need the interior of the water column, which is re really important, and that's where the moorings and the gliders come into play. For models, we have what we call our West Florida Coastal Ocean Model, which consists of a very high-resolution, unstructured grid model called the Finite Volume Coastal Ocean Model, nested into a global model run by the Navy called the Gulf of Mexico HICOM, or Hybrid Coordinate Model. So across the coastal ocean, we have very high resolution, 31 layers in the vertical, the ability to flood and dry land, plus tides. And by virtue of having high resolution and flooding and drying, we can have a realistic coastline with realistic bottom depths that can go right down to zero, in fact, and, um, and thereby model the coastal ocean properly, including the inlets and the estuaries and, and, and all the connections between the Gulf of Mexico and these inland water bodies. Uh, as you'll see, that's very important. We get our open ocean conditions from the high calm, and then we force the model with both that and the local winds to get the coastal ocean circulation. Mm -hmm. So to, um, 
be able to use a model, we first have to demonstrate that that model has some fidelity with what's really going on in nature. So what you're looking at is a comparison between a observation on the West Florida Shelf from a buoy, happens to be the, the velocity in the middle of the water column from a buoy on a 25 meter isobath. So these currents are about, say, 12 meters below the surface. And that's the top panel. The bottom panel is the same location simulated using our FVCOM, our, I'm sorry, our WFCOM. And with the exception of the amplitude of the simulated currents being a bit anemic relative to the observations, all the fluctuations basically look about the same. Um, the correlation be between the two is about 0.8, and the offset and amplitude in this particular case averaged over the year is about 12%. So we're actually doing a pretty good job of simulating the actual currents. And then if we look at how we're simulating temperature, the um, right-hand panel is an overlay of observed temperature from buoys and the simulated temperature from the WFCOM. And on the left, you see snapshots on several different days throughout the summer of 2010 of the simulated bottom currents superimposed upon simulated temperature. And so from the right-hand panel, you see that the simulated temperatures are generally pretty good. There are offsets in the fluctuations, but the fact that there's a nice stratification between the surface and the near bottom is represented pretty well in the, in the model simulation. All right, so given that we're, you know, with, with errors, do noted, given that we're at least getting the currents about right and the temperatures about right, we can now use the model to diagnose how the coastal ocean circulation is actually working and use it to address specific questions of societal concern. So let's move on to the first topic then, the GAG grouper recruitment. There's a paper that I can supply to anybody that's interested that goes into the details. So the fundamental problem is that gag adults are known to spawn offshore from late winter to early spring. Their juveniles settle near shore some 40 to 70 days later. And so just how the larvae get from spawning to settlement was a mystery. We solved this mystery via circulation model simulations for spring 2007 when gag juveniles were caught on Mullet Key, which is at the entrance to Tampa Bay. So on the left, you see a picture of a gag juvenile. Um, my colleague and co-author, Ernst Peebles, actually brought a bucket of water into my office one day and put his hand into the bucket and pulled out this fish, that, that guy you're looking at there. And he said, well, I just got this at Mullet Key, and it was co-located with microalgae, a macroalgae of hard bottom origin. So we kind of knew where it was coming from. And um, so below the picture of the fish, you can see the distribution of the gag juveniles that he caught on Mullet Key. There was a big concentration of them in the last week of May that peaked on about May uh, 24th. And so we knew the end point, so where they settled, the question is, can we account for where they came from? And so we um, set up an experiment to do so. Now before I show you the outcome of that experiment, let me just give you an idea of how the deep ocean can force the coastal ocean. So what you're looking at is, again, a map of sea surface height, the colors, red being high, blue being low, and surface geostrophic currents 
the vectors calculated from the sea surface height gradient. And so you see the loop current and an eddy, the two red uh, places. The loop current happens to be hitting the shelf slope not too far away from the dry tortugas. And on the shelf itself, you can see arrows pointing from north to south, all the way from the northern portion of the West Florida shelf, right down to the dry tortugas. So the loop current, by coming in contact there, is actually setting the entire West Florida shelf in motion. We can model that, which is shown in the next slide. And so on the top, what you see are near bottom currents superimposed on temperature, averaged over the entire month of April 2007. And the lower panel is the same thing, but now averaged over the entire month of May 2007. So we have a rendition of the average currents for two different months. What you see in April is that there was a very strong upwelling circulation. If I showed you the surface currents, what you'd see are arrows pointing away from the coast, carrying water from the shallows to the deeps, whereas on the bottom you see flow from the deep ocean onto the shelf and all the way across the shelf um, in the month of April. In the month of May, that circulation on the outer shelf seems to have abated, but over the inner shelf you still see that there is this upwelling circulation going on. This happens to be very important for GAG, as we're going to see. So the next slide shows the ex part of the experiments that we performed with the model. So we asked the question, if the GAG juveniles were at the surface, could they have been transported across the continental shelf by the currents at the surface. So on April 7th, we seeded a bunch of particles at the surface in the model um, at various isobaths. So from the upper left to the lower left in clockwise order are the results from the 40 meter isobath, the 60, 80, and 100 meter isobath. And so on April 7th, we put a bunch of particles and we let them go. And you're looking at a 45-day simulation. And what you see very clearly are, is the fact that none of these particles at the surface gained any proximity toward the shoreline. They all stayed offshore. So had these been real gag juveniles, they would have been eaten by other fish, and they never would have... Um, gotten to their settlement site. In fact, they would have just disappeared into the food chain. Um, April 7th wasn't the only day. We, we tried a whole series of days. I'm just showing the April 7th results. And so we then repeated the experiment, but now instead of the surface, we examined what was happening near the bottom. Mm -hmm. You get a much different result. So again, particles initiated on the 40, 60, 80, 100 meter isobath on April 7th, integrated for 45 days, and all of these particles gained proximity to the shoreline, and in fact, many of them actually landed on Mullet Key, just where the um, gag juveniles that Ernst Peoples collected, just where they were located. Um, we repeated, again, this experiment for a whole series of, of days that were compatible with when the gag were, um, were actually observed. And we came to the conclusion then that the gag juveniles make their way to, from spawning to settlement along the bottom via an upwelling circulation condition. And as I said at the, at the outset, this finding is supported by the co-location of gag juveniles with macroalgae of offshore hard bottom origin. So not only did the gag juveniles come into the beach, but the plant life that was all on the bottom in that hard bottom area where the adults spawned 
that also came into the beach. So you can argue that the gag juveniles surf their way in on a piece of lettuce. Well, there's a corollary to this, and that is that gag year class success requires upwelling to occur in phase with spawning and to last long enough so the protracted upwelling that's required for a, su a successful gag recruitment year is owing to the deep ocean interaction with the shelf slope near the dry tortugas. In other words, the loop current plays a very important role. And now that we know this, we have a means for forecasting successful gag recruitment years. And what this might mean is that um, if we know when the, when the good recruitment years are, then we can guess at when the good adult population years may be and come up with a, 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 an improved way of uh, regulating the fishing of these, of these creatures. It turns out that I don't think gag are the only ones that follow this rule. If I look at um, what we know about goliath grouper, a protected species, and even what we know about certain forage fish, uh, I think they follow similar, similar rules. So the ocean circulation then becomes a critical element in the understanding of fisheries. Okay, so that's my gag story. Let's, um, let's move on to the next topic. And that is how Deepwater Horizon oil arrived on northern Gulf beaches. And there's a recent paper that we just published that explains this, if you'd like more details. All right, so here's our starting point. Um, the black area is the location of oil as identified through satellite imagery on May 24, uh, 2010. Um, the, the, well, the well exploded and sank uh, earlier than that. It was on April uh, 10th was the explosion. But the oil took a while to get into the coastal ocean, with the exception of the Mississippi River birds foot, where because the, the wellhead was very close to that, prox that vicinity. But for the oil to get onto the northern Gulf shoreline, it really took some time. And once it got close, it, it got onto the beach really quickly. But by um, as late as May 24th, there still wasn't oil along the northern Gulf beaches to the east of, um, of Louisiana. All right, so that's the distribution of oil. And the other things you're looking at are the surface geostrophic currents identified through satellite altimetry superimposed on sea surface temperature. And a very curious thing was happening. You can see that little nose of oil that got entrained into a loop current eddy. We were all concerned that oil could have gotten trained into the loop current and flowed through the Florida Straits. But around May uh, 18th, that eddy broke off from the parent loop current. And so that oil that got into the eddy actually did spin around the eddy, but um, it never got into the, the, the loop current itself because there was a separation between the two. Had that loop current eddy not been shed, we would have had um, oil along the Florida Keys. All right, that, let's, let's move on. That's just an aside. Okay, so the experiment we did was to initialize our model with particles at the surface where oil was observed and to add additional particles every hour to, to represent the continual flow of oil from the wellhead. Recall that the wellhead wasn't capped until July 15th. So that's our initial distribution. And every hour, we added nine more particles near the wellhead, and we tracked these. When these particles were outside of the WFCOM domain, we used the HICOM. And when the particles crossed over into 
the WFCOM domain. We used the WFCOM. So we, had, we derived a continuous way of tracking particles from the deep ocean into the coastal ocean. All right, so let's take a look at results on June 19th. And so what you're looking at is the distribution of all the particles that, and that, that move from May 24th through June 19th. By June 19th, there are a lot of particles that got into the coastal ocean and actually got onto the beach. There's two panels. The upper panel is the result using only the ocean circulation, only the currents driven by the deep ocean forcing and the local forcing. The bottom panel is that plus the effects of waves through a phenomenon known as Stokes drift. So waves generally don't move anything other than the waveform, but um, there actually is a small, subtle movement due to a process called Stokes drift, which I won't explain today, but just take my word for it. So as we see on June 19th, there were particles in the coastal ocean. There were some particles on the beach without Stokes drift, but with Stokes drift, there was a lot more particles on the beach and a lot more particles in the vicinity of the coastal ocean. Now, another thing I want to draw your attention to, I guess you can see my cursor, is here are the barrier islands off of Alabama and Mississippi, and here's the mainland shoreline. So in this model simulation, because we have very high resolution, we can include the barrier islands, the inlets between them, and so we can actually model the movement of oil to the barrier islands, through the inlets, and to the mainland beaches. As far as I know, this is the only model capable right now of doing that. Um, the Navy's HICOM versions, either global or Gulf of Mexico, don't have resolution high enough to include these features. The global HICOM doesn't have the barrier islands at all. In fact, it's coast, I think its coastline is at the barrier islands. Gulf of Mexico HICOM includes them to some degree, but they don't have the inlets cutting through them. Only by having enough resolution can you actually look at the movement of particles through the intricate coastline as occurs um, in any coastal ocean. Okay, so that's the story on June 19th when beaching of particles had already become quite pronounced. The maximum rate of beaching actually occurred uh, on or up to June 27th. And so you're looking now at the same kind of rendition. The top panel is without Stokes drift. There are particles on the beach. There are particles in the coastal ocean. The bottom panel is with Stokes drift. There are a lot more particles on the beach and a lot more particles in the vicinity of the coastal ocean. And the ages of those particles are younger. And so we're seeing many more particles that have gotten from the wellhead to the coastal ocean and on the beach. It's, it's, it's a little hard to appreciate that from this rendition alone. So let's go ahead and just look at the, the coastline. So the top panel shows all the particles that were beached by 627 along with their ages. The bottom panel, and, and the top panel is without Stokes drift. The bottom panel is the same thing, but now with Stokes drift. The one thing you see immediately is a lot more younger particles that have beached with the Stokes drift. But the really telling point here is if you look at the upper right in either of these panels, you see that without Stokes drift, 278 out of 8,416 particles were beached, or 3% of the total number of particles introduced to the water by 627 
were beached, 3%. Whereas the lower panel shows that 2,299 out of 8416 particles were beached, or 27%. So we had a much more substantial number of particles making it to the beach with the Stokes drift than without the Stokes drift. Now the next question is, does any of this make sense with regard to what was actually observed in nature? So if we take a look at the next panel, these are the observations. So this is the distribution of beached hydrocarbons determined throughout the whole course of the deep water horizon oil spill. So this doesn't stop at 627, it goes through uh, August. Most of the particles did beach by 627, um, but what you see very nicely here, by the way, blue are observations without oil. Gray and the other colors are observations with oil. So what you see from the observations is that from <clears throat> Cape Sandblast through about this part of um, Louisiana had oil with the maximum oiling between here and, and here, but substantial oiling over here as well. <clears throat> so if we go back and we just take a look at the patterns, what you see is that we did pretty good. And more oil did, or more particles did show up here later on in our simulation. I just haven't shown, shown those. So we actually got the distribution about right. So why is it that the Stokes drift is important? OK, so what you're looking at are renditions of velocity vectors modeled with our WFCOM and the velocity vectors due to the Stokes drift at three different locations perpendicular to the shoreline. The top one is very close to the shore, five to 10 meter isobath. The next one down is about the 20 meter isobath, and the next one down is about the 30 meter isobath. So let's look at the bottom one first. You can see that the vectors are all over the place uh, owing to the circulation. And then when you go to the middle panel, you see they're starting to rotate and when you get to the top panel, they've pretty much rotated parallel to the shoreline. Whereas the Stokes drift does not have that constraint. The Stokes drift doesn't have to rotate at all because the waves can actually break right on the beach. So that's one point. The other point is the ocean circulation is much larger than the Stokes drift. So we have three things. One. Ocean circulation is much larger than Stokes drift. Two, the ocean circulation tends parallel to the shoreline upon approaching the coast. And thirdly, the Stokes drift remains perpendicular to the shoreline. So from these um, simulations, we, um, we come up with the following findings. The ocean circulation is responsible for getting oil to the vicinity of the shoreline. The wave effects by Stokes drift are responsible for depositing the oil on the beach. And these findings are physically intuitive because in shallow water, the circulation tends to align with the shoreline, whereas the Stokes drift tends to be perpendicular to the shoreline. So having learned that, we now know that several things are required for tracking oil. First, we need a very high resolution coastal ocean model downscaling mm -hmm. from the deep ocean across the shelf and into the estuary, something akin to our WFCOM. We need a wave model for calculating Stokes drift. And we need a sufficiently accurate deep ocean model supported by adequate observations for data assimilation. And the same tools that are required for oil are required for anything of an ecological nature on the shelf. So there's nothing unique about tracking oil. If we want to track red tide, we want to track fish larvae, we want to track any, any harmful spill, or even do a search and rescue operation, we need these 
same tools. Now, there's one more point I want to make. Uh, that last open circle, a sufficiently accurate deep ocean model. We did a lot of experiments. And um, the Gulf of Mexico, high, there are two high comps in the Gulf of Mexico. One is called the Gulf of Mexico high comp. It has higher resolution than the other called the global high comp. It turned out in 2010 that the global high comp with lower resolution was actually more accurate than the Gulf of Mexico high comp. And we found out the reason why. There was a, a spurious eddy that um, just popped up in the higher resolution GOM high com, which was right near the wellhead. And it wound up shifting the particles too far to the east. And so it deposited them in places where they weren't observed. Whereas the global high com didn't do that. The global high comp was more accurate. So mm -hmm. the deep ocean circulation is, in essence, unconstrained by topography, whereas the coastal ocean circulation is. It's easier to model the coastal ocean circulation than the deep ocean circulation going to those constraints. However, because the deep ocean circulation is less constrained, you better have data to assimilate into it. Otherwise, errors will appear. Those errors will grow. And those errors will then dominate the simulation. And the simulation will be completely wrong. And so that's why data assimilation is so important for deep ocean models and why we need to have data, more data than we presently have. All right. so. That's that point. Let's move on then to the last example, which is the control by the circulation of K. brevis red tide blooms on the West Florida Shelf. There's a lengthy uh, listing of, of publications. Um, and again, I can make these available if anybody's interested. But why am I harping on publications? You know, I. I I think that coastal ocean observing has to be science-based. If it's not science-based, we're just not going to know how to even effectively design an experiment. And so unless we collect these data, uh, impose rigor rigorous scientific analyses on them, they don't really carry all that much value. And so that's why I'm harping on the need for not only collecting data and doing simulations, but looking at them with a really keen scientific eye and using them scientifically. That's why the publications are, are so important. All right, so um, what's the K. brevis problem? Well, you might have guessed by now, K. brevis is a fancy Latin name for some critter that um, gives us respiratory distress and uh, kills fish and does all kinds of nasty stuff. It's a slow-growing dinoflagellate, and it requires nutrient deplete conditions to outcompete faster-growing diatoms. This generally occurs at mid-shelf in springtime. Red tide blooms then occur along the shore in late summer and fall if the K. brevis cells are transported to the shoreline. Anomalous upwelling caused by loop current interactions with the shelf slope near the dry tortugas. These can bring deeper ocean nutrients onto the shelf, favoring diatoms and suppressing K. brevis red tide. And this occurred in 2010, which I'll show. Um, so, Deplete nutrients, the fancy word for that is oligotrophic. The West Florida Shelf is generally described as being oligotrophic, um, but it's not always oligotrophic. There's plenty of nutrients in deep water. All you have to do is bring that deeper ocean water across the shelf break, which happens regularly. So the shelf break region always has adequate nutrients. The near shore always has adequate nutrients because it 
comes off the land. But those nutrients near the shelf break and near shore get consumed rather rapidly, leaving this broad mid-shelf region nutrient deplete unless we have a protracted upwelling event that lasts long enough to bring water of higher deep ocean nutrient levels across the shelf. Well, this did happen in 2010. We have a, a glider survey from July. Um, the top panel is temperature. Next panel down is salinity. Next panel down is chlorophyll. And then the last panel is uh, colored dissolved organic matter. Uh, just look at the chlorophyll one. Um, you see this line of high chlorophyll uh, that begins offshore in deeper water, uh, because there you do have plenty of nutrients below the thermocline. But you also see a lot of chlorophyll on the shelf, particularly at mid-shelf. And uh, that's because there were high nutrients there. Well, we can only surmise there were high nutrients there. We don't have the observations. But um, otherwise, the plants wouldn't be able to grow. So there was a big phytoplankton bloom at mid-shelf in summer of 2010, it was not Cape Brevis because we never saw Cape Brevis at the beach that year. It was diatoms. Okay, so we have an observation of it. And then we went ahead and inspected satellite altimetry for the whole era of altimetry, which is 1993 through the present time. And what you're seeing is a kind of a table from 93 to 2015, 23 years, 19 of which we were able to identify either a major red tide bloom or a lack of a major red tide bloom associated with either no substantial loop current interactions or substantial loop current interactions. Only three, only four of those years was there a lack of a red tide bloom when we thought, you know, maybe there should have been one. There were no instances from 93 through 15 when there was a red tide bloom when we thought there shouldn't have been one. So we got a little, uh, we got a little cocky about our ability to um, predict the seasonal occurrence of red tide. And so here's kind of the story. So following explanations of why there was no bloom in 2010, why the 2012 bloom was robust, whereas the 13 bloom was not, we then successfully predicted in 2014 and 2015 that there would be red tide blooms. That's when we got a little confident. And in mid-June of this year, we opined that there would not be a major bloom in late summer, fall of 16. We even got cocky enough to have a press conference. <laughs> well, we were wrong. <laughs> and so um, there's a major bloom ongoing right now. It's quite obnoxious, actually. I was just on the beach in uh, south of here, actually for the last two weekends in a row, and uh, we were coughing. So... What this demonstrates is that the only real constant in science is surprise. And also why our coozes are so important. Because it's not that we don't know what we're doing, but we need observations in support of our work. Now, we think we understand why there was a major bloom this year. The mechanism that we present is correct. We have no, no uh, doubt about that. But there was a major bloom in 15. There was a resurgence of it as late as April of 2016. And so there was still, apparently, there was still enough Karenia cells in play when we had this major upwelling that continued. And so during the spring bloom period, apparently there was enough nutrients to keep all the phytoplankton happy the diatoms, and the Karenia. And as uh, Yogi Berra once told us, 
it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Okay, so the findings from C, and we haven't changed our mind about this, K. brevis, a slow-growing dinoflagellate, is generally outcompeted by diatoms, but the injection of new inorganic mm -hmm. nutrients via upflowing across the shelf break favors diatoms over K. brevis, suppressing red tide blooms. And from this, we realize that both the ocean circulation physics and the organism biology are necessary conditions for a K. brevis bloom, but neither alone are sufficient conditions. And I think this applies to anything of an ecological nature on the West Florida shelf or anywhere in the ocean. All right, so let me conclude. Coastal ocean stewardship requires a multidisciplinary approach, including coordinated observations and models, i.e. our coozes. The reason is ecology is not just biology. Ecology is the sum total of all processes responsible for an organism to make a living. By determining the water properties in which organisms reside, the coastal ocean circulation is of fundamental ecological importance. And adapting our science strategy to accommodate these facts will facilitate understandings on how the coastal ocean system works and enable better environmental stewardship of this region where society meets the sea. So I hope what I've done is at least explain what a coastal ocean observing system is what an ARCUS is, and why they're really important. And thank you for your attention, and I'll try to uh, address a question or two. Bob, thank you so much for your great presentation. Um, we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions. If you have any, please type them in the bottom left-hand chat that box. We have about 10 minutes. I'm not seeing any right now. Um, so I went ahead and also put um, Bob's email in the chat box if you would like to follow up with him directly and maybe get a copy of his paper as well. So Bob, I'm not seeing any questions. Oh, somebody has their hand raised. I see an I do. I do. Um, Enrique, if you could just type it in. Actually, I think I can unmute you. Enrique, do you hear us? Sorry, I, I was on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, you were talking about um, red tides being generated uh, offshore and then being brought by circulation towards the coast and then either competing with diatoms or, or generating a bloom. And I was wondering if, if uh, there are other mechanisms that are triggering these blooms probably related to uh, large river runoff during the rainy season. As we have seen in the past, in the, over this past year, and probably over the past two or three years, we see large um, red tides happening along the coast, which seem to be associated with uh, uh, with runoff. So that's a, that's a really excellent question. Of course, that's been a thought that's been ongoing now for quite some time. Uh, we have shown in in several instances now that the origin of the red tide is offshore and that it does get carried in. Now, of course, when it gets carried in, if there are abundant nutrients that will help sustain a bloom, and red tide, my understanding is they, they're particularly keen about organic nutrients, whereas at, at mid-shelf they're getting inorganic nutrients. So the fact that this year, the bloom really blossomed after um, there was a major sewage spill, kind of supports you know, your argument. But I don't think they originate in the nearshore region. 
They manifest in the nearshore region by an upwelling circulation, which normally says in around fall. Um, but they will, they can be increased in intensity by addition of uh, a, of more stuff. Okay, thank you. Okay. So actually, no, it's just the follow-up. The, the real issue, and the real missing link here is we don't get offshore to make measurements of just about anything except for some of the physical oceanography. And why is that? I don't, I don't know. We just can't seem to get the agencies to recognize that those observations are of critical importance. Even right now, we just... We just had a glider survey that we were able to supplement and get a glider out there. There's all kinds of, uh, of chlorophyll offshore at depth right now. We think that's Karenia coming in, but you know we didn't have any bottle samples, so we can't really do the microscopy. And even though we're inferring nutrients from the other water properties, we, we, we don't have support to go out and actually sample nutrients. So this is such a prolific continental shelf, supports such amazing fisheries, and has these interesting red tide phenomena. We think we understand what this stuff is all about, but for some reason we just cannot get the support to make the measurements that are needed to really pin down mm -hmm. you know, the theories that we're advancing. That's been very frustrating. All the more reason why ARCUs are so important. Does anybody else have a question? You can type them into the chat box or raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, Jim Nelson has a question. Um, Jim, I think you're connected on a landline, so I don't know your phone number. If you want to go ahead and type it into the chat box, I can get it answered for you. Jim, I may have unmuted you. Are you a 912 number? That's right. I hear him. Go ahead. Okay, good. Thanks. Um, Bob, you've been doing this for quite a while, and you've gone through kind of the ramp up, ramp down of observing systems in the southeast. Could you make some comments on uh, kind of the development, both of the models, modeling capabilities, and then our observing capabilities, what we've had in the past, what we have now, and what we need? Sure, that's a that's a great comment. Um, you know, I use has been around now. I, I like the the timeline I give it is 2002, when there was a wonderful little pamphlet published, uh, kind of laying out the concept. But prior to I use, we started building these coastal ocean observing systems under congressional earmarks. And there were earmarks going around the entire coastal ocean, so this isn't the only place. And so from about 1998 through around 2007, we had a combination of earmark money and competitive research support money, um, both here and everywhere around the nation. And people were building these observing systems. We were learning a lot. Uh, 2007, the earmarks went away, and we became dependent upon um, uh, the U.S. IU's office in NOAA to support this work, and we've been under continuing ever resolution ever since, and funds both in in well in actual in actual inflation corrected dollars has been diminishing, not increasing. So um, certainly in the southeast region, the amount of resources that we have in the water has dwindled, and right now we're just kind of holding on by a thin thread. Um, 
the model development has kind of gone along the same way. And I had thought when we had this Deepwater Horizon incident that there would have been all kinds of money for observing and modeling the coastal ocean. It just hasn't materialized. Um, the the, the uh, uh, Most of this money has gone to agencies that have used them primarily for political purposes. Um, some of the money now is being earmarked for the deep ocean, which is good. And But the coastal ocean has really gotten short shrift. And as far as models go, um, I don't think, this is my own personal opinion, but I don't think we're in any better shape today, seven years after the Deepwater Horizon event, than we were back then in being able to model the movement of, um, of, of oil. Uh, the high comms are the same. They're very good, but they're the same. Uh, we don't have, they, they need more data for assimilation, but nobody's willing to fund that. Um, the coastal ocean model, at least ours, that, that, that has improved. We, we did initiate that, but um, there hasn't been much interest in, in supporting that going forward. And so it's been very frustrating, and I think that uh, it'll probably get a little worse before it gets better. So um, somehow we need to remedy this, this problem of how we deal with the coastal ocean, which, as I've said, is where society meets the sea. This is what we really need to understand if we're to become better environmental stewards. And, and we need... We need agencies to step up and realize that. Thanks, Jim. Any more questions? All right, so being conscious of the time, um, if you have any further questions, you can go ahead and email um, Dr. Weisberg directly. His email is weisberg at usf.edu. I also um, typed it into the chat box. The next webinar is going to be March 21st at 12 p.m. Eastern, and it's going to be focusing on the Sakura data portal. Kyle Wilcox from Axiom Data Science will be um, doing a presentation and demo. And as I stated earlier, a recording of this webinar and a PDF of the slides will be on the Sakura website, sakura.org slash webinar series. Um, so please join us March 21st, 12 p.m. Eastern for the next um, webinar. Thank you all so much, and thank you, um, Bob. Really appreciate it. Well, thanks, everybody, for being on board. I think these were important, and uh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.